at certain points during the call. You can enter a question at any time using the Q&A feature in Live Meeting. Just click on Q&A, then you can type in your question and click the word Ask. If you haven't already, you can uh, introduce yourself. We have handouts for today's session. At this time, it is my pleasure to turn today's session over to your presenter, Tracy Immel. Tracy, you now have the floor. Thanks so much, Heather. And good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to wherever you are in the world. Um, again, it's such a pleasure to see uh, this global community that's uh, been created with uh, 70 plus attendees from places um, far ranging, Mexico, Albania, India, Moscow, Finland, Scotland, and to our friends in Russia. Um, We're looking forward to the opening ceremonies uh, here, which we'll watch in the States tomorrow night. So congratulations on hosting the Olympics. Um, okay, well, this is our um, final session on 21st century learning design before I get to meet you all face-to-face -face, uh, in Barcelona. And um, last time um, from our session before, we had uh, some homework. So we asked you to adjust an activity based on your uh, learning from that session, try it out with students, um, capture some experiences in your journal, and then read the two rubrics we'll be looking at today, which is real world problem solving and using uh, technology for learning, and then coding these four uh, different learning activities. So let's get everybody warmed up by starting with a poll. Have you made any changes in your teaching or to a specific learning activity delivered to students as a result of the work that we've done so far. All right, a good chunk of you have absolutely stepped into it and made some adjustments. And I am so appreciative of that 26% of you who are honest and say, things have just been too busy. I haven't done it yet, but I plan to. It's in the works. So for those 74% of you who did say you've made some adjustment, adjustments, I'm curious, what have you noticed happening? Um, you go ahead and use the tools at the bottom of your screen. There's a little check mark there. This is called the whiteboard feature. And go ahead and click on that check mark and tell us what you have noticed with your students or with yourself. All right, so some of you have noticed that students are more engaged in the learning, that they need to practice the ability to collaborate. I think this is especially true if you're working with younger students. And a few of you are admitting that it was difficult to let go of some of the control. When we turn over learning to students, it's necessary that as educators we take a different role in the classroom. And as I've worked with educators, um, around the world on 21st century learning design, I know that some of that feedback has been it is difficult to step into that role of coach or almost tutor uh, as opposed to the holder of all knowledge. Thanks so much for, for sharing your feedback and hopefully some of these results will be encouraging to those um, of you who haven't made adjustments yet you can really see that making these small changes in learning activities and teaching style really create a, a different kind of learning environment for students. So if you think about the six uh, rubrics that we uh, have as part of the 21st century learning design, last time we covered knowledge um, 
construction and collaboration. And this time we'll be covering the use of ICT for learning and real world problem solving. Now I just want to remind you all that as you go and do some of this work with uh, educators in your own schools or around uh, education systems around the world, a very important thing to remember is that you'll want to cover the uh, knowledge construction rubric off before you dive into the use of ICT for learning, which is what we're going to work on now. Now, one of my favorite places in the world is Lesotho, South Africa. I was able to visit Lesotho a few times uh, a few years ago, and it's a very interesting place. Um, it is extremely poor with uh, the highest HIV rates uh, in the world. And on the one hand, you have uh, this scene uh, as you're driving through the community of the 700 schools or so that are located in Lesotho. At the time I was there, only a handful of them actually had electricity. But as I traveled through uh, the villages, what I found was Everybody had a cell phone. And everybody, including uh, the elders in the community, wore their cell phones around a lanyard around their neck. So you have uh, this very interesting dichotomy where new technologies are really transforming the way we interact, um, where mobile connectivity is commonplace, where uh, communication um, especially around social media, is really creating its own vernacular and language. And um, we have these round-the-clock um, opportunities of public uh, interaction uh, via technologies like Twitter. And in fact, a, a study done uh, in 2009, the purveyors of that study actually said that students are, are living their parts their lives virtually and literally all a Twitter. Now, what's interesting to me is in a very short period of time, from 2009 to 2013, um, this Twitter has actually been um, declining in the area of youth use, and um, as have Facebook. And what's taking its place is uh, Snapchat and these kind of photo uh, sharing sites that are used to tell stories. So when you think of the technology changing that quickly, um, something as pervasive as Facebook, now, um, you know, especially with our, our younger uh, students um, moving to different platforms, what ways should education need to uh, be organized differently and if we think about the implications for uh, curriculum, pedagogy, assessment, and teacher training, um, there are many, many uh, implications in the way education needs to transform as well. So while we know that technology has a great potential to connect people from around the world to enable access to education that has never been uh, available uh, before, including uh, different resources, where it's really breaking down the, the barriers of, of geography, what we know from that study that we looked at in our first time together was that technology, when it's being used in the classroom with students, are still being used for very, uh, to support very traditional teaching. And so what I want to ask uh, you right now is to think about, um, as we are learning together, think about that rubric that you guys um, hopefully read, the use of ICT in learning. And let's talk about how we can use that rubric to help teachers build higher order thinking skills into their learning activities. So if you think about the Great Train Internet sample learning activity and the use of ICT, go ahead and mark how you believe that lesson scored. 
And what I want to do is remind you of the definition of knowledge construction from our last time. Knowledge construction happens when students do more than reproduce what they've learned. They go beyond knowledge reproduction to generate ideas and understanding that are new to them. Often considered critical thinking, these are the activities that require knowledge construction to ask students to interpret, analyze, synthesize, or evaluate information. The reason it's so important to remember what we mean by knowledge construction is because that piece is a central component to this particular rubric, as you see there in uh, to be able to code a three using technology to support knowledge construction. So I'm going to be quiet for a few moments while you have an opportunity to review the rubric and the learning activity. And if you're willing to share with the group your thoughts on why you coded the learning activity the way you did, please turn your seat yellow. And you can use that with the feedback tool in the upper right hand corner of your screen. Turn your seat yellow if you'd be willing to come off mute and to walk the group through why you coded the Great Train Internet the way you did. And I see Mansar uh, Rashed, and excuse me if I'm mispronouncing your name, Mansar has uh, turned his seat uh, yellow. And Mansar, will you be willing to walk us through in uh, about two more minutes? Okay, now Sarah is having a problem with his connection right now, so I'm going to ask uh, another person to volunteer. Um, Shiroma, um, boy, and I know I'm probably really making it difficult for your name, but uh, Shiroma. Can you come off mute and walk us through how you coded the Great Train Internet? Uh, 
And again, the uh, microphone icon is up in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. And if you click that icon, you'll be able to unmute yourself. Thank you, Heather. Jerome, are you there? Yes, ma'am. Oh, we have a very difficult time hearing you. Can you speak? Uh, yes, I'm afraid that it's not going to work because we are having a very difficult time hearing you. So what I'm going to ask is um, for, let's see, I'm going to try one more person, uh, and hopefully they'll have a, a better connection. Uh, Marie Helene, are you able to come off mute? Marie Helene? You hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you, Marie. And please uh, introduce yourself and tell us where you're calling from. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm a French teacher, an ESL teacher in France, and I'm calling you from uh, Boulogne-sur-Mer in the north of France. Thank you. Welcome, uh, and thank you for volunteering to help us out. So how did you code the uh, Great Train Internet? And if you could walk us through your thinking, that would be wonderful. Okay. Uh, I voted for number two, which is not the most popular one. <laughs> and I did that because I feel that the they really use information and don't do in fact they kind of copy it, you know what I mean? So that's why I chose number two. Okay, so Marie uh, Helene doesn't believe that it met the bar for knowledge construction and so she coded uh, at a level two. Can I ask someone who chose level three uh, to come off mute? Uh, introduce yourself and tell us why you believe it met the bar for knowledge construction. And I'm going to try to do this a little more freestyle. So just take yourself off mute using the button in the upper right hand corner. Introduce yourself and tell us why. Come on, I see other people. Karina is yellow, so she should be able to take herself off mute. Uh, Dr. Frolik, um, Shampa. Hello. Anutosh. Uh, good evening. This is Anutosh from India. Hello, Anutosh. Thank you so much for being brave enough to take yourself off mute and to help us understand why you uh, believe it met a different criteria. Uh, actually, students love to work on Internet to gather resources uh, than the library because it's very interactive and uh, resources are available. So I find children use Internet to uh, create your their work, and uh, it's, it's a big support. Okay, and, and what uh, what did you choose to code the uh, lesson as? Yes, madam. Did you what number did you code the lesson as? Number three. Number three. So, yeah. can you uh, tell us what was the evidence in the lesson? that there was knowledge construction happening. Um, what evidence did you find of knowledge construction? Hello? Yes. We can hear you. Oh, it sounds like Anatasha is also having some, maybe some technical difficulty. So I think that 
that um, we can agree that students used ICT. They had websites and other computer resources that they used to learn about the Victorian era. era. And then they had to analyze that information that they found in order to decide what was most important when they presented it to their classmates. So that's how the uh, activity would qualify as knowledge construction or knowledge building, because they needed to utilize all of the different information that they found uh, on the internet, synthesize and evaluate that information in order to create their presentations to classes. However, you can Yes, hello? Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Please. Thank you very much. So again, you, you found that there was evidence in the activity that uh, the technology was being used for knowledge construction. Um, and that's, that's why you coded it as a three. Uh, thank you so much for participating. And um, it, if we think about the four and the five, um, I think that what's really interesting about this lesson is that while in many places in the world, ICT would not be pedagogically necessary because students would have access to uh, the same knowledge in, in books, in a library, or printed materials, which means it would not meet the level four criteria. But it really depends on where in the world you are, what your school setting looks like, and what the resources of that school are. So in some uh, classrooms in the world, this lesson could meet uh, a level four uh, if that same information was not available uh, in a, a library or via, uh, via books. So I think that it's important for us all to remember that context is, is important when we think about 21st century learning design. OK, so let's go ahead and go to the next uh, lesson that or learning activity that we asked you to code. And that is the uh, Olympic site selection. And again, I'm going to give you um, a few minutes to review um, the learning activity and to recall the, uh, the rubrics, again, the details for you to um, mark what you believe this learning activity uh, demonstrated. And remember, we look for evidence, not what we think the in, uh, intention may have been of the teacher or what we would have done. We need to look only at the evidence presented in the learning activity. And I'm going to try it again. If you could please uh, turn your seat yellow if you would like to walk the group through your thinking uh, of this particular learning activity and how it codes for the rubric.
I'm going to give folks two more minutes. I'd really like to see everybody. Don't worry about being wrong. Just give it a shot. Okay, uh, we have Anna Lucia, who has uh, volunteered to walk us through her thinking. Uh, Anna, please introduce yourself and tell us where you're from. Hello, can you hear me? I can. Okay, hello everybody. My name is Anna Lucia Sela. I'm from Guatemala. Well, I gave it a four because I think that the students were able to use internet to search for different, well, in the three sites that they mentioned there. However, I'm not giving it a five because I think that their result was writing in just the letter. So I would say that it could be better if the student would use technology also to check, for example, the how can I say it, the, the letter and the writing that they used. So I think that's why it is a four, because they just use it to get information about the places. Okay, so um, you felt that it met, uh, obviously, the number one, code number one, because they did have the opportunity to use technology. Um, it met a two because the students used the Internet to get the most recent data on volcanic uh, in activities and earthquakes from specific countries. And that uh, it met the three because they used that technology to support knowledge construction in that they had to analyze the results from the, um, the different information they received from the different countries in order to make a, a recommendation, that they did not hit a five, you believe, because their end product was a letter as opposed to a technology product created for an authentic use. Is that correct? Yeah, that's my opinion. OK. So let me ask you uh, this, Ana Lucia. What, um, can you think of a way that the learning activity could be adjusted so that it would meet that five? Well, um, maybe students can, when sending their letters, maybe the students can create like a presentation to show the benefits, advantages, or disadvantages of building the, the, the site in the place they were, they were asked to investigate or research. Beautiful. So if, if the students actually built a, uh, a presentation, maybe a multimedia presentation or a, a wiki site um, uh, or, you know, even um, it could be a, a Facebook page that presented the information that they found to the communities and the Olympic Site Selection Committee, then it would have met the Code 5. Exactly, Absol that's what I think. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, well, thank you so much for uh, volunteering to, uh, to help the, the group with their learning. And um, I want to, I'm going to just uh, pause a moment on this next um, slide. It's an um, infographic that I love. 
But while I'm paused here for you to be able to take a look at it, I want to provide an opportunity for any uh, questions or clarifications uh, from the group before we move on to the next rubric, which is real world problem solving and innovation. Okay, well, I know it's a very short amount of time that we're able to spend on this and um, uh, a kind of an interesting um, format given the, the webcast. And again, uh, in Barcelona, I'm, I will look forward to, uh, to doing this in a more interactive way face-to-face -face, and really modeling how this professional development can look when you're working with teachers in your school or in your community on 21st century learning design. Um, so let's turn our attention now to the next um, rubric, which is real world problem solving and innovation. And the kinds of questions that we can ask ourselves um, are really in thinking through what the core elements are behind this concept um, and why these skills are necessary. You might remember from our first time together, uh, we talked about this slide uh, from Daniel Pink's book, uh, A Whole New Mind. Really, with um, his hypothesis is that you know education systems of the past supported the needs of the past. And the conceptual age differs from the errors in the past in that it now really requires people whose skill sets are different from those dominated by the left hemisphere of the brain. And according to Pink, the conceptual age workers really need to be able to create artistic and emotional beauty to detect patterns and opportunities, to craft a satisfying narrative to be able to tell a story, and to combine seemingly unrelated ideas into novel inventions, to empathize, to understand these subtleties of human interaction and find joy in oneself and elicit joy in others. I think that's a really beautiful explanation for where we are uh, in today's world and the skills that are needed for students to be uh, successful. More specifically, I'd love to get your thoughts, and you can jot them down in the uh, shared notes section. What are the characteristics of a 21st century learner? What do you believe the characteristics are of a 21st century learner, those skills that are important for students to have in order to be successful in today's conceptual age, as Daniel Pinkett calls it, or knowledge economy, as we've heard from others? critical thinking, creativity, uh-huh, collaboration, kind of they're aligning to the 21st century learning skills that we're looking at, aren't they? Absolutely. Well, really, when we're creating a learning society, it uh, takes all of these skills uh, to be successful in uh, a workplace that is supported by technology um, as it is today and, um, and requiring that uh, innovation. And that's really one of the things that this um, rubric discusses uh, is how do we support students to become real world problem solvers in the classroom? to be making that content relevant uh, to them and um, asking them to think critically about creating uh, solutions to uh, problems in their community and giving them an opportunity to solve those problems as well. So if we think about the rubric of uh, real world problem solving and innovation and we apply those rubrics to the house on Mango Street, how would you 
code the house on Mango Street utilizing those rubrics. The learning activity's main requirement is not problem solving, which means the house on Mango Street would code a one, whether or not the learning activity's main requirement is problem solving. Then is that problem solving real world? And then finally, a code four, whether students are required to implement their ideas in the real world or at least communicate them to someone who could implement them outside of the academic context, outside of the academic context. And remember from the rubric, the big idea here is that problem solving involves a task with a defined challenge for the student. It happens when the students must develop a solution to a problem that is new to them, new to them, or complete a task that they have not been directly instructed how to do, or design a complex product that meets a set of requirements. That would be the definition of problem solving. Problem solving in a real world context is about creating an authentic situation for students where there's a need that exists outside of the academic context. And I'm going to give you three minutes to think about this. And if you would like to walk us where you're from? Uh, yes, of course. Uh, can you hear me? We can. Yes, um, my name is Dalia Yunus. I am from Kuwait. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for this uh, uh, useful webinars uh, that you are um, introducing to us as expert educators. And second, to discuss uh, this um, rubric uh, and this learning activity, I think uh, it didn't uh, meet uh, any of uh, the um, uh, choices that we have, but number one, the learning activities main requirement is not problem solving, because we have here uh, in uh, number two uh, for the teacher, what did you hope your students would learn from this learning activity? The teacher said, uh, my students or the students will gain an awareness of the immigrant experience. So it's mainly about gaining information, and afterwards he says to have understandings uh, of the challenges Im immigrants face. Uh, of course, they had uh, some interviews with immigrants, uh, and they uh, reproduced a poem, but uh, they didn't uh, have a call out for the world for or uh, telling the world about this problem, finding solutions. Uh, uh, searching or inspecting uh, around their community, what can they do? How can they uh, overcome the problems facing these uh, immigrants? So I think uh, number one will uh, suit uh, this learning activity. Okay, thank you so much. So you believe that uh, this learning activity scored a one, that it did not meet the bar for um, problem solving, or uh, real-world problem solving or implementation. Yes. Yes. Um, thank you so much. Is there someone on the on the call who would like to uh, come off mute and tell us why they believe it did meet um, the problem solving bar to score at least a number two? Hello, this is Gloria Wood. Can you hear me? Hi, Gloria. Yes, we Hi. can. And where are you calling from? I'm calling from Jacksonville, Florida. 
And is it nice and warm in Jacksonville today? It is raining a lot right now. <laughs> oh my <laughs> gosh, that figures, that figures. Thank you, Gloria. So, so tell us how you coded um, the house on Mango Street and, and what evidence you used to get there. Well, I coded it at three because um, I did see, number one, um, it was problem solving because they, they didn't have a previous knowledge of uh, what the immigrant life was or anything like that. So I gave it a one for uh, problem solving. Then uh, number two, because it was a real world, world problem, um, and they were going to interview the immigrant experience, so that's that's very real. And a three because um, they, even though it was problem solving and real world problem, they didn't innovate. Um, they just turned in a poem and let the teacher grade it. So they missed that number four component that were, was innovation. They could have created a wiki or a web page or, um, I don't know, um, a multimedia kind of presentation, and that would have brought it to a four for me. Okay. So, uh, Dahlia, are you still on the line with us? So from, from Gloria's point of view, it, uh, the, the students did work on uh, a real-world problem. Hi, Dahlia. Give me one minute, and then I'll ask my question. Okay. Um, from Gloria's point of view, it, it hit a three because the students were asked to conceptualize the immigrant experience by interviewing an immigrant in their community, so it was real-world. And then they wrote a poem aimed at increasing awareness of um, uh, immigrants in their community for their community. But they didn't share their poem outside of the classroom, so it didn't meet that level four. So what I'm curious um, about, because really, again, this is a great example of the power of 21 CLD or 21st century learning design is not whether the coding is right or wrong, whether Dahlia is correct or Gloria is correct, the learning comes from the interaction between the two. So Dahlia, what I'm going to ask you to do is can you think of a way that you could refine this learning activity so that for you it would clearly meet the level three? Okay. Uh, the students uh, can put the, the information that they gathered uh, for example, and um, recreate their own community, uh, uh, their own, for example, um, uh, a Facebook uh, page, uh, and uh, start to uh, raise votes uh, from their community uh, about how to help these people. So they are solving uh, a little part of the problem itself, uh, trying in their uh, small community to uh, overcome the problem. They can do this, or they can, um, uh, for example, um, uh, ask immigrants to explain their own uh, problems, uh, make the interviews public for the community, for example, or uh, um, yeah, such things like that. To take the information okay. from, yes. So, so I think that this is a great um, example of how I, some people will read this learning activity and see it as a as a free as it is written, and others will be wanting stronger evidence. So both Gloria and Dahlia did a great job of highlighting how they could, um, in a more evidence based way, move this lesson activity further along on the rubric. So having a clear essential problem or essential question that they were trying to solve. Um, for example, raising awareness in the community of, you know, maybe it's uh, immigrant discrimination or a lack of empathy that the community is having for immigrants, which is the uh, real world problem that the students are trying to solve. Um, then making, taking that information and, and having students go one step further while they did write poetry that reflected the immigrant experience, 
they uh, could have gone to more depth and, and actually met a level four if they created a, a product that would um, actually reach the community. So again, whether it was uh, interviews that got posted on YouTube, um, a community event uh, where people would come to a particular place to, to read the poems, all of those ideas would, uh, with more clarity, bring it to a higher level of learning. So thank you so much, um, both of you, for participating. And let's go to the next um, learning activity, which is the um, doing business in Birmingham. And again, utilizing the real world problem solving and innovation rubric, please um, mark how you would score this and turn your seat yellow if you would like to uh, walk the group through. Um, and again, I'm going to give three minutes for people to, uh, to consider how they would score. Oh, Gerard doesn't have a microphone. <laughs> no worries, Gerard, no worries. OK, how about Alberto Castellano? Alberto, would you like to take yourself off mute in the upper right-hand corner and walk us through? I scored it a four because you have a sustainability question that the kids are solving and learning about sustainability. Then they took it to into the real world and went to their community and went to different businesses and educated business uh, members about sustainability and actually asked questions of them how sustainable their businesses were and then ranked them according to that and they then put all of their information all their research about just the background information is about sustainability as well as their findings and their rankings of every um uh, business on the wiki and so it was public for everyone to see um, and I felt that was real world. Fabulous. So you scored it as a four. Yes. So um, it, students worked through a complex project and they developed a solution for increasing awareness about sustainability in the community. So that is evidence that it was indeed problem solving which would take us to a two. Uh, at least, it was a real-world problem given that sustainability was a real issue in their community, not just uh, an issue in general in the world, but it was an issue specifically in their community, which would take us to a three. And then, as you indicated, they put their solutions into practice by actually educating the businesses around them um, on the recommended practices for sustainability. So they took their communication and, and their solution to the broader community. Thank you so much, Kelly. I appreciate your help. You're welcome. So if you think about this rubric, um, you know, students focused on solving problems can do really amazing things. Um, and I wanted to show this uh, example of a group of students um, from 12 different schools in March um, 2010. They were uh, based primarily in the Asia Pacific region and were invited to uh, Singapore for the Innovative Education Forum at that time. And that's where this project really started to take uh, shape. They um, worked on the problem of deforest action and students and teachers decided that they wanted to um, continue that work outside of the forum. And you can go to uh, this website, this Deforest Action website, where really from around the world, um, they have created uh, action around um, the problem of deforestation. And there's actually a documentary uh, movie um, that they are uh, working on now. So um, this solves all kinds or this scores high on all kinds of the rubrics that we, um, we looked at over the last two sessions. So when you turn children onto a problem, 
that uh, needs to be solved and they're able to explore their learning in that kind of an authentic way, uh, really magical things can happen both for them as learners but um, for the greater community as well. So with that, we are just about at the top of the hour. Um, I have just a couple of slides left uh, to talk about what's coming up. So um, before the Global Forum, this is your homework. I'd like you to read the self-regulation and skilled communication rubric and go ahead and code the following four learning activities um, according to the self-regulation and skilled communication rubric. Because we won't be getting together again before the forum, please email your community manager with the codings for those four lessons against the two rubrics, and they will email you back what um, the learning activities uh, scored and why, and you can do some personal reflection on that. And then, as always, consider adjusting a learning activity, uh, either the one that you submitted for the forum or uh, a different one that you can use uh, sooner in your classroom with students. The sooner that you can take action and uh, try these things out with your students, the better. And also, I just want to encourage you, you know, six rubrics is pretty overwhelming. If you're looking to really make a change in your own teaching um, environment, especially when you're working with other teachers, what I always suggest is taking maybe one or two rubrics to focus on uh, at a time rather than trying to look across six different rubrics and making changes across six different rubrics. That can be quite um, a daunting uh, experience. And then finally, for the Global Forum, again, just before leaving, I suggest that you review the uh, six rubrics again and refer to the cheat sheet that was shared on the last uh, webinar. That cheat sheet is kind of how judges will be looking at uh, your project and really reflect on what evidence, specifically evidence, that you can demonstrate to judges um, how your submitted learning activity addresses these different 21st century skills dimensions. You'll have a very short time uh, with those judges uh, to make an impression. And utilizing the language and um, showing the specific evidence uh, is going to be helpful for both yourself as well as uh, the judges. Please bring your rubrics document. Um, it will come in handy as a reference tool as your group creates your Learnathon project. And then um, this is, I think, the third global forum that I will be blessed enough to be at. And based on my experience with educators from the past, please try to relax. You're already winners um, and have a good time. It's a, just an amazing uh, opportunity for you to collaborate with uh, your, your peers, uh, to learn from uh, each other. And getting too stressed out about the competitions, I think, takes a little bit of that away. So this is just Tracy's advice. Try to relax and, and have a good time. And I'm so looking forward to uh, seeing you in Barcelona. I'll have 90 minutes uh, with you on Tuesday morning to kick off um, our time together. And uh, we'll have some fun and uh, do a little bit of learning at the same time. So with that, I want to thank you again for your uh, presence. Um, big thank you to the volunteers who came off of uh, mute and helped us learn uh, from their experience today. And with that, I am going to turn the mic over to Kirsten Panton, who's going to talk a little bit more about uh, the judging um, at the forum. So Kirsten? Thank you, Tracy. So with that, um I just want to hear, can you hear me all right? Because I'm having some issues with my headset. We can hear you. Good, thank you. Well, thank you all for being on this call. And, and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the um, judging process, both for the individual projects as well as for the Learnathon. Uh, as Tracy said, my name is Kirsten Panton. I'm the, the director of, of Partners in Learning in Western Europe. 
and I'm been in, I'm in charge of the judging process and has been for the past four forums. So we've built on and on this experience that we had, and and hopefully we are we've, we've prepared something professional and good for you for for the forum. So I'm going to to spend. Um, 15 to 20 minutes and then we have time for questions because I'm sure there will be questions for from some of you about this process. So first of all, Tuesday the 11th and Wednesday the 12th of March, that is the date where you will be exhibiting your individual projects. The judging process itself has actually four steps. So the judges will, prior to the forum, have familiarized themselves with your learning activity and the two-minute video you have created. So the judges come from all parts of the world, but they all speak English, and that's why it's really important that the, the learning activity and your video is in English, so they can, they can um, familiarize themselves with your learning activity. At the forum, they will interview you. And the judges will then come together and discuss the coding or the scoring. They have given you a learning activity, and they will agree on the right scoring at the end uh, after their discussion. So four steps into the, into the judging process. The, the judging process itself uh, on, the, on the two days. First of all, for the feedback we've had previous years is that you as educators always think there's too little time for you to look at the other teachers' great projects. And uh, this year is even worse because there's so many. We have 267 individual projects. So there's a lot of projects to go out and be inspired by and a lot of colleagues to talk to from across the world. So what we're doing is we're going to, to um, divide you into an A team and a B team. And, and when, when you are not, when it's the A team time, that's when the A team teachers should be at their kiosk in order to talk to B team teachers to be able to come up to them and hear about their projects. There will be a sign on your kiosk that tells you whether you are A or B, but please respect this and please take time to go out and talk to the others. Um, and, and we think this is really important. Of, you, you probably won't have time to talk to 266 other teachers, but, but make time and, and try and talk to as many as possible. We know also from experience that this is so inspiring, and, and hopefully you'll connect a good, um, with a lot of other teachers and, and have some future collaboration across the globe in the future. So on the Tuesday and Wednesday, the judging is going on. On the first day on the Tuesday, every project will be judged by one judge. And all projects will be judged by two judges. You will get what we call individual dance cards. That means on your kiosk when you come, apart from your whether you're number A or number B, there will be the time slots on your kiosk that tells you when the judges are coming. So you'll know exactly when they're, they're coming, and you can prepare for that. And it also means that if you have other people coming up talking to you, and you can see this is the slot, that this is now I'm being judged, you, you can prepare for that. You can send people away. It can give you some relaxation, as Tracy was just referring to. So you will have uh, your digital story, your three-minute pitch in the PowerPoint that you know how you can how you can start the conversation with the judges. This is especially helpful if you're not a native English speaker, because this gives you the, the to feel confident that you can now start the conversation. You can present your your project, and and please make sure that you during the interview. Uh, take it easy. I mean, the judges uh, want to do it as good for you as possible. And, and the very important thing is that you show the judges some student evidence of the project. This is what they're specifically looking for. So proof of how your student has worked with this, if you have little video clips showing it, if you have photos showing how the student works, if you have, I mean, if, if, if of course your project hasn't been going on in English, 
um, it, there's no point in showing the judges lots of uh, written stuff in a different language because they won't understand that anyway. But any kind of evidence that proves that how, how successful and interesting your project has been, that's what the judges are looking for. If you don't have a lot to show, talk about it. Tell them how, how it's worked. And also, as you know, you're being judged by the 21 CLD rubric. We don't expect you to be to be top of all the, the the different skills in the rubric, of course. But but try and pin out the particular uh, skills that you have worked the most with out of the 21 CLD, and and that that's also a really good um, thing to pinpoint. And you might, you know, on your way to Barcelona, you suddenly think, oh gosh, there was something here. I I should have I should have added that to my digital story. I mean, just just tell about it, talk about it what you've discovered, what you've found out. You might have been inspired by the teacher next to you. Draw that into the conversation. It's really important that you make the most of these uh, 50 minutes, approximately, that the judges have time for you. So think about it. This is your 15 minutes. You have them twice. And it's up to you to, to be as active as possible. Um, what we discovered, this is uh, from last year, we had a judge from the U.S. And, and he was actually, when he went through the training of the judges, which is the 21 CLD rubric, he said he had no idea that judging was research-based and so professional. And I think that's a good message to you as well, that we're trying to make this, we're doing our utmost to work with the judges to make this as fair a judging as possible, because we definitely... We definitely want to do this in a way that, that we are awarding the, the people who have done the most outstanding work. But I would like to repeat what Tracy said. I mean, of course, it's, it's great to be awarded. But I mean, you're all here because we, we assume and believe and think we have proof of you being the most innovative teachers on the planet. So we think you're fabulous anyway. And I mean, please bear that in mind. It's a competition, but it's mainly for the fun of it. So I know you're quite familiar now with the 21 CLD that, that is research-based, that is based on the innovative teaching and learning research uh, that Microsoft sponsored and that was carried out by Stanford Research International. And where it was uh, interesting to look into three buckets of ways of teaching, uh, which was skills for life and work, innovative teaching practices and learning um, and, and looking, sorry, looking into the skills for life and work that students are needed in the innovative teaching practices and in the three buckets of learning beyond the classroom, student centered pedagogy, and ICT for learning. And, and of course, based on this, the 21 CLD rubric was, was, um, was developed. The categories, I know you've, you've received um, information about this, but this is just to repeat. So the five categories that you will be, that we will be awarding. So there'll be one winner and one runner up in each category. Or I know this is a US centric way of saying it. So there will be a winner and a number two person in every category. So there will be extended learning beyond the classroom, knowledge constructing, construction and critical thinking, cutting it, use of technology for learning, collaboration and teacher as innovator and change agent. You're very familiar with these uh, categories now, which is great. Um, and and, uh, and, and it, but it's just important to know that this is what the judges are looking into and this is what they will be questioning you around. It's important to know from you that all judges have educational roots. People, they come from all over the world. I think we have, uh, we have 100 judges precisely. And I think there's all the other They come from 70 odd countries. So a really international representation. The judges all have roots in education. It means they are either come from ministries of education, they come from universities, or they are very engaged with, with education in some kind of way. So they're, they're here for them. They, they come here, they are high-level people. They come to Barcelona uh, in their own spare time, so to speak. They, they give this time to, to you, to Microsoft as well. And, and they're here because they're really interested. They really want to see what you've been doing. And, and they are, they're just as excited about it as, as we are. The judges spent uh, all of the, the morning till 
uh, of the of the Tuesday, the 11th of March, to be trained on the 21st CLD rubric. And uh, we take them through a pretty harsh uh, tour de force of 21 CLD. And they, um, so they're all quite familiar with how to do it. It's important to know that some of you will be interviewed by more than one judge, well, more than two judges. There will be an extra judge coming up talking to you. They're part of what we call the SWAT team. So we have 15 judges who are very experienced judges. They have been with uh, these forums and trained on 21 CLDs, and they've, they've been through the forum several times before. And the reason why you will be judged by an extra judge is if uh, a judge comes back and say, I've seen this project, it is um, it is fabulous, but I'm really, you know, I, I really find it difficult whether I should, it, whether it's a two and a four in this category, could you go out and, and tell me your opinion? So it, it doesn't mean that the project is either particularly fabulous or particularly less fabulous. It just means that another judge had doubt on how to score it. That way, we just want to make sure that everything is done as fairly as, as possible. It's uh, important to say that by the scoring, so and, and also for yourself, you're not supposed to categorize your project, the learning activity. That will come up uh, through the scoring. It's always like the, that um, we have the categories, and the, the project, your learning activity, always bubbles up in in one category above the others. And that's the category it ends up in. And that's the way we, we award um, and find the award winners. So um, it, it, it seems might seem a little strange, but it completely works that way uh, through the through the judging. OK, to walk on to the next exciting thing that's happening. It's uh, Thursday the 13th and Friday the 14th. We have the Learnathon and the judging of the Learnathon. And uh, I know on the last call, um, Taryn went through uh, what is a learning learnathon, but I'm just going to repeat very quickly. It is a 24-hour activity where you are supposed to really prove, walk the walk of the 21st century skills that you've now been trained on. You will work with other people from different parts of the world, and uh, the themes, the teams that you're going to to work in are almost ready, and I believe Taryn is going to communicate them to you very shortly. But the idea is that you will work together in order to design a learning environment that displays innovative use of technology. And you are innovative, you are fabulous, you are creative, and we are expecting that you will do something new, something different, something creative. Maybe something wild, something out completely out of the box. It's completely up to you. Don't feel that there's strains put on you because you have to use the rubric uh, like a tick box. Don't think that way. But work, you know, let all these great ideas bubble up and, and, and create what you think is the most interesting. And then say, you know, did, are we, uh, what kind of collaboration do we have here, for instance? What kind of, do we really have all the things that we needed around communication, for instance? So, so use it as a, not as a tick box the way you think you have to do in order to create a learnathon, but use it as a sort of, a, I don't know, like a, like a little memory thing that you, you take into consideration after you've decided what you're actually planning to do. Maybe in a way to sort of sharpen up the, the learnathon. Uh, through the uh, through the process of designing it. So first of all, be creative, think out of the box, have fun, relax. And when we say 24 hours, the, the sort of official uh, stop of the day is at, at 6 p.m. But um, you can work through all night if you want to. You have your hotel rooms, you have the corridors, you have the lobby, you can do whatever you want. It's up to you as long as you are ready by by the time slot you will be given when you have to present your, le your learnathon. So it's important to say that um, you, this has to be in English. And in your teams, uh, not only not everybody can speak English fluently. Some people speak English very basically. Some speak it fluently. Some are English native speakers. Uh, but the importance is that you work together and you can get uh, one of, of the people or two of the people from the team who speaks the best English, if you feel most confident about this, to present the Learnathon. 
The important thing is that you feel comfortable about who is presenting it. It's up to you and the team to decide who is doing it. But make sure whoever does it speaks English well enough for the judges to understand what they're saying. Um, you, it, it would be great if you could create this uh, a well-described learning activity that you could take back and use in your own school. Maybe turn it into a, an international project where you work with the other uh, team members in their schools and, and create great projects like that in, the, in the, either this school year or the coming school year, whatever suits you the best. You will have 10 minutes to present to the, to the judges panel. So not a long time, but, but uh, we think and believe enough. As it was said last time by Taryn, you are not going to be given a template uh, of what you need to put into your into your uh, learnathon or into your learning activity that comes out of the learnathon. These are just more or less cut and paste questions from the cheat sheet, but it's a good thing to do when you sort of want to sharpen up the edges of the learning activity, ask yourself these questions and say, you know, did we actually reach this level of, of um, 21st century skills in the, in the project? But take them as guidelines and, and, and also you're not supposed to have all six in there in every single uh, one of your learning activities. You can definitely build on some of it and leave some of it out. That's the way it is expected to be used. Uh, the learners on themes will be poverty, sustainability, and gender equality. And uh, in the communication that Taryn will send out, and Taryn, you can come on afterwards and correct me if I'm saying something which is not correct. But the idea is that you, um, you're supposed to um, ask for the theme that you would prefer. So you communicate back to Taryn and Rosanne the two themes that you would like to work in, either one or the other, in prioritized order. So that way we can hopefully get you into the theme that you prefer or the theme that you prefer as number two. These are all great themes. They are linked to the Millennium Goals. And uh, we believe that everyone could have something interesting to say and have their students work with under these themes. Yep, that's exactly, I will not correct you because that's exactly right. <laughs> okay, thanks, Taryn. So how are you going to be judged? How is it going to work with these uh, judging panels? So think of it as the X factor. Uh, I assume, I think that almost everyone in the planners has, has the X factor program in their country. So you have a panel of judges and uh, you have the opportunity to come in and present to them. So you have but I can tell you one thing, the, the, the panel of judges are not going to have a new buzzer, so you will not be buzzed out after two minutes for sure. You will have your eight minutes to present, and there will be two minutes for questions from the judges. And then you have to leave, and there's going to be uh, a person there being very strict on sending people in and out, because we are on a limited time scale here. And uh, so it's all you have. 10 minutes to prove that you have pedagogical X factor. And I mean, you can sing, you can dance, you can show videos, you can do all sorts of crazy stuff in those eight minutes. It's completely up to you how you want to, to, um, to, 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 to show what, you, what you've come up with. And that is it. So with that, I think we should open up for questions. I'm sure I haven't covered everything that people want to, to know. We've got seven minutes left, so it's time for questions. Please do. Hi. Sorry, can you say that again? Yes, that's correct. Exactly. 
So what happened? So that's a really good question. Yeah, that's a really good question. That's a very good question. So what happens is that the judges then scores your your learning activity under all the the categories. So they use the 21 CLT rubric and they code uh, your learning activity under every category. So for instance, in in uh, in in one category, they 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 are, they score it a two. In the next category, they score it a four. In the next category, they score it a three. So the category that ends up with the highest score, that's the category that your your learning activity ends up in. Does that make sense? Okay, good. So it, it does seem strange, but I, I can assure you that, that the way the judges work, the way this is happening, we have never been in doubt. It's always been completely clear which category the project ends up in. So it, it, the, 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 you can say that the, the coding rubric, it works. Any other questions? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. All right. So I am Dominique from France, and I have a question concerning where uh, all this will be taking place. Will, because will we have time to uh, uh, come with uh, computers or machines that we could uh, install before we start? Or uh, do we have to start straight away? So Taryn, do you want to hop in for this as well? But the, it will be at the conference yeah. center. But as far as I understand, you can go anywhere you want. But, but you will have plenty of time for this. But Taryn, do we have any additional information on this? Yeah, so on our last call and, and our previous calls, we've gone over the, the load in and load out times. But you will have times, um, and, and you'll see if you re re read your guide to the forum, which we'll resend in our recap email, there's a, <clears throat> excuse me, there is a, um, a whole schedule that allows for time to get yourself set up. We've allowed for setup time. And then you're going to have some free time as well um, after, you know, while others are being judged. So um, that is every, all of that has been allowed for, and it's in that guide that we send you over your way. And also it's important to know that, first of all, we are telling the Microsoft Partners and Learning Managers that they ought to be there uh, during the day so that they can support you if there's anything you need. And also the so-called SWAT team of very experienced judges that we have, they are the ones that will be that will be divided into the judging panels. But in the morning, they will be there for an hour and a half to give you any kind of coaching you might want from them. And they will also do a checkout in the evening before they, uh, you, there's, um, you have to leave the conference center. They'll be back for there as a sort of checkout time where you can ask them questions. So they are, they're very, very welcome to support you in the process. Uh, but that doesn't mean they can't judge you at the end. So there will be five um, people from the SWAT team on each panel, and there will also be one student. So we have some some um, elderly students, so they are um, in the upper secondary education, and there will be one student on each panel, and they are not trained on 21 CLD, but they can just give their opinion saying, you know, wow, I love to be part of this, and this is interesting, and I wish this was in my school or whatever. So we're, for the fun of it, we're having one student on each panel. Any other questions? OK. That gives you two minutes back. Taryn, back to you or Rosanne, if you want to say a few words before we finish off completely. Oh, thank you so much. Um, thank you very, very, very much to Kirsten and to Tracy for the time on this call today. Um, we know that as you digest this information, there might be more that comes up. Your community manager will be contacting you uh, within the next 24 hours with all of the documents that I mentioned, and um, they'll also be telling, answering any questions that you might have, so please direct questions to them. The one thing I would say is that take a look at that guide um, first before you do anything, because a lot of our answers to the questions are embedded in it and we'll be able to uh, answer further questions from there. But we are extraordinarily excited to see you in Barcelona. Um, you guys are an inspiration. We, I, I brag about you here at Microsoft all the time, and all the executives are very excited to meet these uh, amazing teachers from all, all over the world. So thank you again.
uh, and expect communication from us in the next couple of days. And uh, Heather, I'll, I'll leave it to you to close. All right. Thank you so much, Taryn, for your presentation today. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us. This does conclude today's live meeting, and you may now disconnect from the session. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.